Part two of Damn, a Book of Calumny. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Damn, a Book of Calumny by H. L. Mencken. Part two. Eleven. A True Aesthetic. Herbert Spencer's objection to swearing, of which so much has been made by moralists, was not an objection to its sinfulness but an objection to its charm. In brief, he feared comfort, satisfaction, joy. The boarding houses in which he dragged out his gray years were as bare and cheerless as so many piano boxes. He avoided all the little vices and dissipations which make human existence bearable. Good eating, good drinking, dancing, tobacco, poker, poetry, the theater, personal adornment, philandering, adultery. He was insanely suspicious of everything that threatened to interfere with his work. Even when that work halted him by the sheer agony of its monotony, and it became necessary for him to find recreation, he sought out some recreation that was as unattractive as possible, in the hope that it would quickly drive him back to work again. Having to choose between methods of locomotion on his holidays, he chose going afoot the most laborious and least satisfying available. Brought to bay by his human need for a woman, he directed his fancy toward George Eliot, probably the most unappetizing woman of his race and time. Drawn irresistibly to music, he avoided the Fifth Symphony and Tristan und Isolde, and joined a crowd of old maids singing part songs around a cottage piano. John Tyndall saw clearly the effect of all this and protested against it, saying, He'd be a much nicer fellow if he had a good swear now and then, that is, if he let go now and then, if he yielded to his healthy human instincts now and then, if he went on some sort of debauch now and then. But what Tyndall overlooked was the fact that the meagerness of his recreations was the very element that attracted Spencer to them, obsessed by fear, and it turned out to be well grounded, that he would not live long enough to complete his work. He regarded all joy as a temptation, a corruption, a sin of scarlet. He was a true aesthetic. He could sacrifice all things of the present for one thing of the future. All things real for one thing, ideal. 12. On Lying Lying stands on a different plane from all other moral offenses, not because it is intrinsically more heinous or less heinous, but simply because it is the only one that may be accurately measured. Forgetting unwitting error, which has nothing to do with morals, a statement is either true or not true. This is a simple distinction and relatively easy to establish. But when one comes to other derelictions, the thing grows more complicated. The line between stealing and not stealing is beautifully vague. Whether or not one has crossed it is not determined by the objective act, but by such delicate things as motive and purpose. So again with assault, sex offenses, and even murder. There may be surrounding circumstances which greatly condition the moral quality of the actual act, but lying is specific, exact, scientific. Its capacity for precise determination indeed makes its presence or non-presence the only accurate gauge of other immoral acts. Murder, for example, is nowhere regarded as immoral save it involves some repudiation of a social compact, of a tacit promise to refrain from it. In brief, some deceit, some perfidy, some lie. One may kill freely when the pact is formally broken as in war. One may kill equally freely when it is broken by the victim, as in an assault by a highwayman. But one may not kill so long as it is not broken, and one may not break it to clear the way. Some form of lie is at the bottom of all other recognized crimes from seduction to embezzlement. Curiously enough, 
this master of morality of them all is not prohibited by the ten commandments nor is it penalized in its pure form by the code of any civilized nation only savages have laws against lying per se thirteen history it is the misfortune of humanity that its history is chiefly written by third-rate men the first-rate man seldom has any impulse to record and philosophize his impulse is to act life to him is an adventure not a syllogism or an autopsy thus the writing of history is left to college professors moralists theorists dunderheads few historians great or small have shown any capacity for the affairs they presume to describe and interpret gibbon was an inglorious failure as a member of parliament thucydides made such a mess of his military or rather naval command that he was exiled from athens for twenty years and finally assassinated flavius josephus serving as governor of galilee lost the whole province to the romans and had to flee for his life Momsen, elected to the prussian landtag flirted with the socialists how much better we would understand the habits and nature of man if there were more historians like julius caesar or even like niccolo machiavelli remembering the sharp and devastating character of their rough notes think what marvelous histories bismarck washington and frederick the great might have written such men are privy to the facts the usual historians have to depend on deductions rumors guesses again such men know how to tell the truth however unpleasant they are wholly free of that puerile moral obsession which marks the professor but they so seldom tell it well perhaps some of them have and their penalty is that they are damned and forgotten fourteen the curse of civilization a civilized man's worst curse is social obligation the most unpleasant act imaginable is to go to a dinner party one could get far better food taking one day with another at child's or even in a pennsylvania railroad dining car one could find far more amusing society in a bar room or a bordello or even at the y m c a no hostess in christendom ever arranged a dinner party of any pretensions without including at least one intensely disagreeable person a vain and vapid girl a hideous woman a follower of baseball a stockbroker a veteran of some war or other a gabbler of politics and one is enough to do the business fifteen eugenics the error of the eugenicists lies in the assumption that a physically healthy man is the best fitted to survive this is true of rats and the pediculae but not of the higher animals for example horses dogs and men in these higher animals one looks for more subtle qualities chiefly of the spirit imagine estimating philosophers by their chest expansions their blood pressures their wasserman reactions the so-called social diseases over which eugenesis raised such a pother are surely not the worst curses that mankind has to bear some of the greatest men in history have had them whole nations have had them and survived the truth about them is that save in relatively rare cases they do very little damage the horror in which they are held is chiefly a moral horror and its roots lie in the assumption that they cannot be contracted without sin nothing could be more false many great moralists have suffered from them the gods are always up to such sardonic waggeries moreover only one of them is actually inheritable and that one is transmitted relatively seldom but among psychic characters one finds that practically all are inheritable for example stupidity credulity avarice pecksniffery lack of imagination hatred of beauty meanness poltroonery petty brutality smallness of soul i here present of course the puritan complex 
There flashes up the image of the good man, that libel on God and the devil. Consider him well. If you had to choose a sire for a first-rate son, would you choose a consumptive Jew with the fires of eternity in his eyes, or an Iowa right thinker with his hold full of Bibles and breakfast food? 16. The Jocose Gods What humor could be wilder than that of life itself? Franz Schubert, on his deathbed, read the complete works of J. Fenimore Cooper. John Millington Singe wrote Riders to the Sea on a second-hand $40 typewriter and wore a celluloid collar. Richard Wagner made a living during four lean years arranging Italian opera arias for the cornet. Herbert Spencer sang bass in a barbershop quartet and was in love with George Eliot. William Shakespeare was a social pusher and bought him a bogus coat of arms. Martin Luther suffered from the Jim Jams. One of the greatest soldiers in Hungarian history was named Hunyadi Janos. 17. War Superficially, war seems inordinately cruel and wasteful, and yet it must be plain on reflection that the natural evolutionary process is quite as cruel and even more wasteful. Man's chief efforts in times of peace are devoted to making that process less violent and sanguinary. Civilization indeed may be defined as a constructive criticism of nature, and Huxley even called it a conspiracy against nature. Man tries to remedy what must inevitably seem the mistakes and to check what must inevitably seem the wanton cruelty of the Creator. In war man abandons these efforts and so becomes more Jovian. The Greeks never represented the inhabitants of Olympus as succoring and protecting one another, but always as fighting and attempting to destroy one another. No form of death inflicted by war is one half so cruel as certain forms of death that are seen in hospitals every day. 18. Moralist and Artist I dredge up the following from an essay on George Bernard Shaw by Robert Blatchford, the English socialist. Shaw is something much better than a wit, much better than an artist, much better than a politician or a dramatist. He is a moralist, a teacher of ethics, austere, relentless, fiercely earnest. What could be more idiotic? Then Cotton Mather was a greater man than Johann Sebastian Bach than the average college critic of the arts, with his balderdash about inspiration and moral purpose, is greater than George Brands or St. Beuve. Then Eugene Breu, with his YMCA platitudinizing, is greater than Moliere, with his ethical agnosticism, his ironical determinism. This childish respect for moralizing runs through the whole of contemporary criticism, at least in England and America. Blatchford differs from the professional critics only in the detail that he can actually write. What he says about Shaw has been said in heavy and suffocating words by almost all of them. And yet nothing could be more untrue. The moralist at his best can never be anything save a sort of journalist. Moral values change too often to have any serious validity or interest. What is a virtue today is a sin tomorrow. But the man who creates a thing of beauty creates something that lasts. 19. Actors In France they call an actor a ma tu vu, which anglicized means a have you seen me? The average actor holds the mirror up to nature and sees in it only the reflection of himself. I take the words from a late book on the so-called art of mime by the editor of a magazine devoted to the stage. The learned author evades plumbing the psychological springs of this astounding and almost invariable vanity, this endless bumptiousness of the kabatin in all climes and all ages. His one attempt is banal. A foolish public makes much of him. With all due respect, nonsense. The larval actor is full of hot and rancid gases long before a foolish public has had a fair chance to make anything of him at all. 
and he continues to omit them long after it has tried him, condemned him, and bidden him to be damned. There is, indeed, little choice in the virulence of their self-respect between a Broadway star who is slobbered over by press agents and fat women, and the poor ham who plays thinking parts in a number seven road company. The two are alike charged to the limit. One more ohm or molecule, and they would burst. Actors begin where militia colonels, Fifth Avenue rectors, and Chautauqua orators leave off. The most modest of them, barring perhaps a few unearthly traitors to the craft, matches the conceit of the solitary pretty girl on a slow ship. In their lofty eminence of pomposity, they are challenged only by Anglican bishops and grand opera tenors. I have spoken of the danger they run of bursting. In the case of tenors, it must sometimes actually happen. Even the least of them swells visibly as he sings, and permanently as he grows older. But why are actors in general such blatant and obnoxious asses? Such errant posturers and windbags? Why is it as surprising to find an unassuming and likable fellow among them as to find a Greek without fleas? The answer is quite simple. To reach it, one needs but consider the type of young man who normally gets stage-struck. Is he taking averages, the intelligent, alert, ingenuous, ambitious young fellow? Is he the young fellow with ideas in him and a yearning for hard and difficult work? Is he the diligent reader, the hard student, the eager inquirer? No. He is, in the overwhelming main, the neighborhood fop and beau, the human clothes horse, the nimble squire of dames. The youths of more active mind, emerging from adolescence, turn to business and the professions. The men that they admire and seek to follow are men of genuine distinction, men who have actually done difficult and valuable things, men who have fought good, if often dishonest, fights, and are respected and envied by other men. The stage-struck youth is of a softer and more shallow sort. He seeks not a chance to test his mettle by hard and useful work, but an easy chance to shine. He craves the regard not of men, but of women. He is, in brief, a hollow and incompetent creature, a strutter and poser, a popinjay, a pretty one. I thus beg the question, but explain the actor. He is this silly youngster grown older, but otherwise unchanged an initiate of a profession requiring little more information, culture, or capacity for ratiocination than that of the Lady of Joy, and surrounded in his workshop by men who are as stupid and as vain and as empty as he himself will be in the years to come. He suffers an arrest of development, and the little intelligence that may happen to be in him gets no chance to show itself. The result in its usual manifestation is the average bad actor, a man with the cerebrum of a floor walker and the vanity of a fashionable clergyman. The result in its highest and holiest form is the actor-manager, with his retinue of press agents, parasites, and worshipping wenches. Perhaps the most preposterous and awe-inspiring donkey that civilization has yet produced. To look for sense in a fellow of such equipment and such a history? would be like looking for serviettes in a sailor's boarding-house. By the same token, the relatively greater intelligence of actresses is explained. They are, at their worst, quite as bad as the generality of actors. There are she-stars who are all temperament and balderdash, intellectually speaking, beggars on horseback, servant girls well washed. But no one who knows anything about the stage need be told that it can show a great many more quick-minded and self-respecting women than intelligent men. And why? Simply because its women are recruited, in the main, from a class much above that which furnishes its men. It is, after all, not unnatural for a woman of considerable intelligence to aspire to the stage. 
It offers her, indeed, one of the most tempting careers that is open to her. She cannot hope to succeed in business, and in the other professions she is an unwelcome and much scoffed at intruder, but on the boards she can meet men on an equal footing. It is therefore no wonder that women of a relatively superior class often take to the business. Once they embrace it, their superiority to their male colleagues is quickly manifest. All movements against puerility and imbecility in the drama have originated not with actors, but with actresses. That is, in so far as they have originated among stage folks at all. The Ibsen pioneers were such women as Helena Mujeska, Agnes Sorma, and Janet Achurch. The men all hung back. Ibsen, it would appear, was aware of this superior alertness and took shrewd advantage of it. At all events, his most tempting acting parts are feminine ones. The girls of the stage demonstrate this tendency against great difficulties. They have to carry a heavy handicap in the enormous number of women who seek the footlights merely to advertise their real profession. But despite all this, anyone who has the slightest acquaintance with stage folk will testify that taking one with another, the women have vastly more brains than the men and are appreciably less vain and idiotic. Relatively few actresses of any rank marry actors. They find close communion with the strutting brethren psychologically impossible. Stockbrokers, dramatists, and even theatrical managers are greatly to be preferred. 20. The Crowd Gustave Le Bon and his school in their discussions of the psychology of crowds have put forward the doctrine that the individual man, cheek by jowl with the multitude, drops down an intellectual peg or two, and so tends to show the mental and emotional reactions of his inferiors. It is thus that they explain the well-known violence and imbecility of crowds. The crowd, as a crowd, performs acts that many of its members as individuals would never be guilty of. Its average intelligence is very low. It is inflammatory, vicious, idiotic, almost simian. Crowds properly worked up by skillful demagogues are ready to believe anything and to do anything. Le Bon, I dare say, is partly right, but also partly wrong. His theory is probably too flattering to the average numbskull. He accounts for the extravagance of crowds on the assumption that the numbskull, along with the superior man, is knocked out of his wits by suggestion, that he, too, does things in association that he would never think of doing singly. The fact may be accepted, but the reasoning raises a doubt. The numbskull runs amok in a crowd, not because he has been inoculated with new rascality by the mysterious crowd influence, but because his habitual rascality now has its only chance to function safely. In other words, the numbskull is vicious, but a poltroon. He refrains from all attempts at lynching a cappella, not because it takes suggestion to make him desire to lynch, but because it takes the protection of a crowd to make him brave enough to try it. What happens when a crowd cuts loose is not quite what Le Bon and his followers describe. The few superior men in it are not straightway reduced to the level of the underlying stoneheads. On the contrary, they usually keep their heads and often make efforts to combat the crowd action. But the stoneheads are too many for them. The fence is torn down or the blackamoor is lynched. And why? Not because the stoneheads, normally virtuous, are suddenly criminally insane. Nay, but because they are suddenly conscious of the power lying in their numbers, because they suddenly realize that their natural viciousness and insanity may be safely permitted to function. In other words, the particular swinishness of a crowd is permanently resident in the majority of its members, in all those members, that is, 
who are naturally ignorant and vicious, perhaps 95%. All studies of mob psychology are defective in that they underestimate this viciousness. They are poisoned by the prevailing delusion that the lower orders of men are angels. This is nonsense. The lower orders of men are incurable rascals, either individually or collectively. Decency, self-restraint, the sense of justice, courage, these virtues belong only to a small minority of men. This minority never runs amok. Its most distinguishing character, in truth, is its resistance to all running amok. The third-rate man, though he may wear the false whiskers of a first-rate man, may always be detected by his inability to keep his head in the face of an appeal to his emotions. A whoop strips off his disguise. End of section 2